You are the founder of Cheekbone Beauty, the very first indigenous-owned, founded, clean, and planet-positive beauty brand. David Suzuki, I think it's like 40 years ago, said something about if we all lived as Native people did in their communities, in their authentic ways of living, that uh, our world may look a lot different. Never have we swayed from that foundation of this how important representation is and however that plays out, whether it's visible or the products we put into the world. We are here to represent Indigenous people as they were pre-colonization. Welcome to the Tenzin Show, Jen. I am so elated to have you on. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you as well. You're such a beacon of inspiration and resilience. You are the founder of Cheekbone Beauty, the very first Indigenous-owned, founded, clean, and planet-positive beauty brand. I am so excited because I know that your journey has been so unique. Uh, in fact, your your journey with Cheekbone Beauty is deeply intertwined with your own personal journey of reconnecting with your Indigenous roots, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely not the traditional path, I think, into operating a business. I had no experience in this beauty space, but here I am doing it anyway. Yeah. So how has this personal reconnection, you know, with your Indigenous roots shaped your business decisions and, you know, uh, your your mission with Cheekbone? Yeah. So, you know, the 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 origins of Cheekbone are I had an actual pop out of bed, middle of the night dream. There's three native little girls, they're covered in lip gloss. And I woke up and it's so funny when I think about this now, but this whole idea of this business, it was so real to me that that evening. And, and obviously, ever since that day moving forward, that this business was going to be a be a real thing. But what was really interesting is I didn't have any experience in the beauty world or space. I was just a consumer of beauty products and have always loved beauty, anything beauty. I could literally hang out uh, and unwind in a Sephora or any sort of beauty store any day of the week. But what was fascinating to me was this idea that you could create business that does good in the world, right? Like this whole concept, I was really a big fan of like Patagonia and Tom Shoes. And I was really researching other businesses that were based on this platform or this idea of like social impact. And I thought, is it possible? And then learning and discovering that, of course, the beauty space has relatively higher margins. So it would definitely be an industry where giving back could be a big part of the business plan. So I set out on the path and journey, but I still to this day, I'm really open and sharing that I, I don't know and feel like I, I know what I'm always doing, especially understanding the beauty industry in that world. But what was really important to me and and as we've grown and as I've grown as an entrepreneur was this reconnection to my culture, to my family, to my community as I've been on this path of building Cheekbone Beauty. And I have learned so much about in, in indigenous history how what as anishinaabe people so i come from the ojibwe nation or ojibwe tribe as they say in the u.s a group of people and they're called the anishinaabe people which just means it actually means the people so hmm. sounds funny in english if you're saying it i would be saying the people the people but anyway so i'm anishinaabe this group has like surrounded the great lakes for thousands of years and when i was learning culturally how they survived and how they thrived and their practices and what we call our ways of knowing and being and, and really just how we exist in the world. And there's this true innate connection and relationship to all living things. I've, I've, I've seen it so profoundly play out within my own family dynamics and, and how my family treats creation and, and how they have this just utmost respect and honor for for everything living whether it's water air plant life animal life all of it and i started to dig deeper into all of those things as we were building the brand and i thought wow if we could truly harness like these 
really authentically ancient sustainable teachings and use them when you make and create products and the things that we put into the world, could this be something uniquely special and different that doesn't exist in the beauty space? Because once I entered the beauty industry, I really recognized that it is highly competitive. It's actually quite easy to start a, a beauty company. Anyone can private or white label. We see a million what bath bomb businesses now soap because these things are are not that difficult to accomplish right so it, it's not difficult to make those things but i think creating the market and market demand for those items or in particular a brand that is serving the customer with a lipstick is where you have to uniquely position yourself and find out how you're going to offer something that's unique and special to the space that it already is loaded and inundated with products and so we set out on this path to really use indigenous teachings in my culture uh, on how can we make, is it even possible, like really just hypothesizing, is it possible to be a sustainable brand? And, and sure enough, we've learned that there are many ways that we could do things differently. Um, we could make choices based on putting people in planet before profits, which obviously in most business spaces, those aren't normal conversations where we're generally concerned about stakeholders and their profits versus um, what we're doing to protect the planet or, or human beings for that matter. And so we take it really seriously. It's very difficult. It's not an easy path to have decided to, to go down, but we really talk about sustainability as this journey and that we're really here and open to learn. There's a lot of learnings that have happened and make changes and adjustments along the way and that we know that, um, you know, there's probably some young person working on some incredible innovation in a lab somewhere that could possibly be game changing in, in our industry or our space. And so really just being open to what's coming and what's being made and and being truthful and transparent about how we do things so that we can speak authentically to this concept of using my indigenous roots as the foundation of this brand. And I've really coined and said this numerous times now publicly that I firmly believe that indigenous people are like the OGs of sustainability and looking to like, you know, incredible environmental scientists that have also echoed those words like David Suzuki, I think it's like 40 years ago, said something about if we all lived as native people did in their communities and their authentic ways of living that uh, our world may look a lot different that is so true i completely concur with that because you know we were having this conversation before we started recording the podcast about how even in you know our culture in the tibetan culture um in ancient times when you know our indigenous communities you know i've heard a lot from uh, the people in my community as well that, uh, in Tibet, we had mountain gods, tree gods, we had gods, you know, of different directions, and we had all of that stuff. And, and we were always taught to respect every sentient being, right? And as you rightly mentioned, I think they're truly the OGs of sustainability. Um, it's also really beautiful how you had that way with dream now i feel like it's some kind of divine dream that you had that led you to uh, you know um to create cheekbone beauty how do you interpret this dream today yeah that's a really interesting question because so many times people are like you're you're native so this was like a vision <laughs> and i'm just like you know what i was just like sleeping in my bed and i had you know, and dreams are interesting because they're not like solidly put together, right? Hmm. So I'm remembering the highlights and seeing these three little faces with brown skin and rosy cheeks making a mess of themselves with lip gloss. How did I know it was lip gloss? I have no idea. But what came from that, that dream has been absolutely life changing. I, I, I've shared many times that I had that dream two months after getting sober and I'm really open and honest about sharing my sobriety journey because I, I this brand doesn't even exist or who I am today doesn't exist without that path and so two months prior to that I get sober I'd been battling alcoholism for many years and I have this dream and it was like it was like this whole new and when I look back now 
I really think there's really important intersections of our lives. And there's times when there's things that we have, we have decisions to make or crossroads, if you will, that we come to. And one path can take us one way and one path can take us another. And, you know, I was praying for a new life and to being able to figure out what is next for me. And so, yeah, I, I don't have all the answers, but I believe certainly that the creator of the universe certainly knows what's best for us as human beings. You know, there's this beautiful planet we live on that's designed perfectly for us to survive and not only just survive on earth, but thrive. And uh, so could be divine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think so. Um, so what are some of the recent innovations at Cheekbone that you're super excited about and uh, how does it align with the goals that you have in terms of sustainability and empowering uh, the indigenous culture? Yeah, so we've been working on a project which we call the Niagara Project for for four years now. Uh, we've been extracting actives like one being like resveratrol. There's incredible actives that come from the grape uh, if if you hmm. will. So whether this is the waste of the stems, skins, and seeds. So we've partnered and worked on this with Henry of Pelham, a winery in the Niagara region where we're headquartered. And it's a project that we did. We did with Loyalist College and our chemist uh, and really proven that it does work. We're not the first organization to do this. There's a huge brand in France that has been doing this for a generation, for a generation, I believe, totally like skincare. Yeah. What, but what's really unique about our project is the varietal of grape that we're using is native to the Niagara region, which I find very fascinating. It's a hybrid from a European vine and a a vine that was local to these lands. So like the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe people uh, have been using that long before our, our arrival of Europeans. And then this hybrid, which is known as the Baco Noir grape, which is only in the, the Niagara area. And I believe it's only Henry of Pelham that has it at this time. So that is so exciting because who knew when I, started down this path that we would actually be working on an ingredient and the reason we set out on that journey was much like the food space the beauty space we have to list our ingredients on the package it's it's mandated by health canada the fda and the eu that a lot of different industries have their ingredient listed on the packaging and then not, not only are you listing your ingredient on the packaging you're also listing it in order of importance if you will or volume so based on what ingredient goes into the that formulation so any decent chemist really could reverse engineer um, an inky list to try to reproduce a product. And so for us to stand out as different, I came up with this idea four years ago and thought, what if we made an ingredient that was ours and no one else had? And so that's the purpose of this ingredient project that we're working on. And, you know, we've been working on foundation mm -hmm. for a long time, like having an actual foundation line. It's a really expensive venture. One, because we want our own ingredient to go in it. And two, we live in a world now where shade range is critical. And so for a small business to head down the complexion category, in particular foundation, we're talking about, you know, minimum 26, 40 SKUs, like the big brands like Fenty, hmm. they're listing 56. And so I think the average consumer doesn't know that what that means for a business. And if you're a small brand like ours, we're like indie beauty. We, there's six people that work at our company. And whereas Fenty's, um, you know, led by Rihanna and probably has hundreds of people on different teams and Rihanna's a billionaire. I am not. So when it comes to shade range, each skew, which is each color, our manufacturing partners demand a minimum quantity of generally about 5,000 units. So you can imagine if you have to make 26, 40 shades, the actual cost of launching foundation is obscene. And so we're trying to grow before we were able to launch this project. And so it's something that we're working on, but cost is a real issue for us in this area. So we'll continue to work on the path. Um, but in the meantime, it's given us the time to really work on perfecting the foundation, which is great because it takes about two years from 
any product development project in the beauty space to actually come to life. And we've had a long time to do this. So one, we had to prove the ingredient was going to work. And then now we have to prove the ingredients going to work and be stabilized in the formulations that we're making. So that's the phase we're at. And obviously I'm seeking funding to help grow and expand our product line to be able to do this, to bring this into the world. And we're just not there yet. So I, I kind of like that it's taking a long time because I've learned that slow sometimes is better in business because you don't want to grow too quickly. And so um, growing at the right pace for us is really important, but that's really exciting. I think it's so cool to just be doing stuff that's really working in that innovation space and not just regurgitating. I think I feel really proud that we're not just pumping out somebody else's products. We're actually making our own formulations and building our own stuff at Cheekbone Beauty. So, um, it, you know, what our customers love about the brand is the the products that they're discovering. And I'm really proud of that part as well. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I personally feel that you're on a journey of, you know, zero to one, because it's it's not like this, it's like this. And that path is more difficult. Um, and um, when you mentioned about, you know, product development, I wanted to ask you, I'm sure, you know, all the challenges that, that you have, it's it's just so difficult to deal with them. But at the same time, it's a constant learning experience. You're evolving and you're getting bigger and better. Um, in terms of, you know, incorporating your indigenous values, you know, into being and knowing into the creation of your products, uh, what challenges have you faced in this integration? Yeah, so there's a lot of big decisions that have to be made. And it's a cost thing, but which one thing about Cheekbone Beauty is our investors are Indigenous as well. And we really love this partnership and this relationship because it works because we, our value systems are aligned. And thankfully, Raven Capital, who is our investor, are a social impact investment fund. So they believe in investing in businesses that are making a social impact and, and doing something for the betterment of the world, whether it's people and planet. And, and thankfully for that alignment, it allows us to make decisions that might not always make sense to people that come from, I think, a regular business model mindset. And that is always about just strict profitability. Of course, mm. we want to build a healthy, profitable business. That is, of course, the mission. But along the way, as we have grown, we've had to make decisions that would cost us more because in the long run it's going to cost the planet less or it's going to leave less of an impact on humans and those are decisions that I'm proud to make it's, it doesn't feel tough for me to do that at all I feel personally quite happy to create a company where people are making a healthy living wage and we are supporting our families and then we're also making decisions where we know that the paper and the box that we use, that there's no human that was being treated unfairly in terms of our supply chain because we've vetted that we have an ethical supply chain. Our paper is, you know, FSC certified, meaning that we've vetted that it's coming from protected forests versus just like tearing down trees for the sake of making boxes. Mm. Um, and really looking deeply at all of those things and spending a lot of time you know we just launched our third sustainability report and as a small organization that is a heavy lift to take the time from people on our team to build out these reporting systems to actually prove to our community and anyone who cares to read them because sometimes they are these kind of reports are obviously quite boring but it's actually just sharing with people what we're doing how we've made changes where we still have to need for improvement uh, and and that is truly important. And so we take the time to do those. Like, like in understanding, like on this level, you know, this year we're starting to measure the use of AI technology because of the environmental impact AI has on business. Hmm. And with the growth, the massive growth in the short period of time of AI technology, we know how it impacts water usage. And water is a, a sacred um, commodity and resource that we know is being overly consumed and uh, is going to cause issues in the future. So these are things that we actually look deeply on. So like not only 
when we choose a packaging material for a product, it's not just about those things. It's about all of the the energy consumption required based on that thing. So it's the scopes of of uh, environmental impact that we are continue to grow. And it's because we want to share those things with our community, but it is extremely challenging. It's, it's definitely um, a commitment. But I also like to share with people that it's really important to understand that if us as a small organization can do it, then I hope this pushes the larger organizations that have the capacity and funding to to make better decisions and share with their community and their audiences and be more transparent about how they do things. Because I've worked with people now being in this space and understood from this level of where these giant companies can change like the cap of one product and then they call themselves sustainable because they change the cap and like they spend <laughs> you know, millions of dollars on marketing that. And meanwhile, really, what did that change do? Well, I'd like you to spend the millions of dollars on telling me how that that cap is actually making a difference. Right. And right. There is volume. So it probably is making a difference, but like share that with us. True. I think the big giants are quite a master at wordplay, isn't it? Like yes. to throw in some sustainable stuff in there becomes, you know, uh, good for the planet. But I think it's it's so true what you mentioned. And I hope that this message reaches far and wide uh, that, you know, especially major companies in the world that we have today I think truly they need to learn from you and, and this brand about being so true to your mission and your cause. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about your your uh, personal resilience journey, because I know that um, learning about your grandmother's residential school experience has shaped your personal resilience and also um, somewhere impacted the business philosophy, right? So could you please enlighten us a bit about that? Yeah, for sure. So at a much, I think at an older age, I was 38 when I learned about the residential school system sad but true that even as a woman that lived in Canada all these years and is Ojibwe, I had no idea that that's what happened. So it was 2015 and this final report, the TRC from the Truth and Reconciliation was released to not only the country, but that's when I started to read and learn about what had happened. And then from my family got more information of this is what both of my grandparents survived and in particular I know more about my grandmother's story but being six years old taken living in this this boarding school system till she was 16 and just understanding that everything that was really robbed from her was robbed from me my siblings my dad my aunties my uncles my all of our communities and it really impacted us in such a negative way and when I learned this information, I learned the term generational or transgenerational trauma and understanding what she survived and knowing many Indigenous kids did not survive this. She survived this, but then had to live with this, the, the horrors afterwards and really what that meant and how we are literally just beginning to heal from those things. But when I think about my grandmother, I am really driven by her her strength as this woman and knowing she was like four foot 11, but left that system and ensured, like she made sure all of my family spoke the language Anishinaabe Moen. My uncle Gabe teaches Anishinaabe at the University of Minnesota. It's like she made certain that this they weren't going to rob her of that language. And language is so critical, important. I don't think sometimes as humans we understand how important language is. And when you think about that, if someone was trying to teach me something in a completely different language, it's never going to touch my heart the way I would learn something in English. And so now I recognize that her language or my family's language this was like the language of her heart this is where things connect for for us as humans and so i feel so empowered by knowing that she made this her 
mission and my family proudly speaks the language and still does because honestly I know so many families that the language was lost and has been lost and there's many indigenous communities where language has completely disappeared and so I feel her strength when I think about the the lengths that she had gone to to make sure that this that our family didn't lose the language that's true grit i think you know even after everything that she had been through she still made sure that the language was preserved yeah right that's quite incredible now i know where you have where you get the strength from where you get the you know gumption from uh to be this wonderful entrepreneur and to accomplish um this uh, higher purpose um speaking of accomplishments i have a long list but of course i'm gonna use this list to let our audience know how uh you're 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 just doing incredible in your industry you've been recognized as chatelaine's woman of the year in 2019 listed in the Canadian Businesses 2022 New Innovators list and included in Entrepreneur Magazine's 100 Women of Influence in 2022. So Jen, how have these honors impacted your professional trajectory and personal sense of accomplishment? Yeah, I, it's really interesting because you think um, I had this conversation with our investors, actually, not well, just one of them not too long ago. And it feels like there's so many like of these things that you don't know are going to happen along the journey. Like you have no idea. It's not like anyone sets out and is like, I'm going to do this so that, you know, I can land on that list or something like that. Like those thoughts don't cross your mind. It's just when I really believe that when you set out with, like heartfelt intentions to do something good and for cheekbone the that intention for our why we exist has always been this foundation at our brand which is this idea of representation and how much it matters and that was the heart of who we were and how then we show up now in the world is where representation matters on so many levels not only seeing ourselves as indigenous people represented but now how our ways of knowing and being could create the potential for better better products in the world right and so that's how we're now representing ourselves and so that's the foundation of it and i feel like just when you go out and and set out to do these things whether in it's so funny because now it's like how did this even happen like it's it's true that you really have to like have this real passion for it because when I look back I'm in a space now that, and this is going to sound very where I feel a little bit more jaded because I my my the veil has been lifted I'm in the beauty industry I now recognize how hard and challenging this is but in those early years um my passion was blinded by this love to make this happen for my people, right? Like it's still there, that still exists, but it's like you're maturing as in a sense as an entrepreneur when you start to see sort of the something for how or what it really is. And I know that that passion and which included this grit and all of those things was like this burning fire in my belly. So no matter what anyone would have told me back then, it was like, I am going to make this happen. And I still now have this burning in my belly, but I, it's very different. Like I'm basing things on data, like really important information to actually still grow this business and make all of these incredible things happen. And never have we swayed from that foundation of this how important representation is and however that plays out, whether it's visible or the products we put into the world, we are here to represent indigenous people as they were pre-colonization. Love it. Absolutely love it. Um, among all your achievements, because we just spoke about them, uh, what are some of the achievements uh, with Cheekbone Beauty that you're most proud of? Yeah, there's... I'm like, it, some of them are like, it's crazy. Like the getting an honorary PhD is something I never thought would happen in a million years. And so 
because one, I was a horrible student in school for most of my school career. And uh, these are things, it's funny, my husband loves academia and was in school for a very long time. And he laughs that I'm the one with the PhD, even though that's something probably he dreamed of getting or doing long before for this ever happened for me. And those are just, I think it's things I'm really proud of. And when I recognize, you know, you try to figure out your role in the world and, you know, I feel like I'm just here to like show other indigenous people that this is possible. Right. Like, cause I, I'm like, I don't have any like super great skill set that I'm like, I'm here to show you that you can do this because of me. I learned it this way. Or I was like, no, now I recognize, no, it's like just showing our people that it's possible and you can do it. Like you said at the beginning of this, like, this is a place in a, a podcast where people kind of are achieving the perceived impossible and we're making those things possible. And I, now I know my role in the world is to show indigenous people that it's possible to do the things that you never thought imaginable, despite for us in particular. And I know that trauma exists in many communities around the world. Um, and for us, and when I think about it, I only know the most about North American um, between Canada and the U.S. Our, our impact because of the boarding residential school system. And so despite all of that, I'm like, look at us. We can still make the impossible happen. Absolutely. And I think you're leaving an, an everlasting positive impact on, on the community. What advice what you give to aspiring indigenous entrepreneurs, you know, social, who are, who are really interested in social entrepreneurship and sustainability. Yeah, I really think it's important of, to know why you want to do it, like set those intentions and then just be so laser focused and understand that it, if you don't give up, it cannot fail. Mm. That's the key. It's all like, it's really quite simple that at the end of the day, it is truly all up to us and, and how much we're going to put in and what we're willing to do, what we're willing to sacrifice to make something succeed. And if we don't give up on that, it absolutely cannot fail. Again, I'll reiterate, I feel like I have no great skills, but the one thing I know I've done every day for the last eight years is I've woken up and I've done something to push Cheekbone Beauty, the brand forward. And that's just being consistent. So true. I completely agree. I think consistency is key. And uh, what you mentioned about, you know, sometimes being a tortoise in terms of our success and growth is completely okay. Because through the journey, uh, if you're able to learn something, and I think more than the destination, you know, what's important is the process, the journey. And in that journey, sometimes we don't realize how much we're growing. We just look at that end destination or end goal. But we don't look at how much we've improved and how far we've come, right? If we look back in hindsight, we're like, oh my God, I took so many steps to be here and look at me now. And I think most people forget that. Um, so looking forward, what are your long-term aspirations? What are your long-term goals in terms of uh, Cheekbone Beauty's mission, values, you know, the core um uh, the purpose that you have with your brand in terms of sustainability in terms of empowerment yeah i wanted to do this a lot faster in the early days but now i recognize this idea of slow can be better right taking our time as we're building this but the whole that the the, the idea of like being a global brand has never left i would love to know that on a on a shelf everywhere around the world whether you're indigenous from whatever continent, you can go into that shop and be a brand that everyone knows was indigenous founded and led and really changed the way maybe we make and create products. And like everyone would know that when they when they see the products, like that's what we would have been known for. So of course, lots of work yet to do there. <laughs> But that's the big, like I have this, that's the big North Star, like that if you could just dream up the best possible outcome, that's it for cheekbone. And then obviously I know this is six of us aren't going to get us to that place. So we, we have to grow. 
um, if it means having a larger organization support us getting there, um, making sure that we stick true to our values if those kinds of things happen. And then also, you know, I have personal goals and dreams of just wanting to do more to support my community. So that's what I see for my future for sure. And whether, you know, sometimes I think about moving back to my community where my reservation is and creating, it's in this beautiful part of the country in Northern Ontario called Lake of the Woods and there's incredible resorts. And I remember my brother before he passed away, we would be driving there and he's like, you know, no native person's ever owned one of these resorts. Um, and there's so many First Nations communities there. And I'm like, if if hospitality was my career before cheekbone, and I think that could be a beautiful way to retire, right? Is maybe own something and then provide jobs that are like right in the community where indigenous people can work. And it could be something that is, um, indigenous owned and operated as well mm, so, so do you look at this happening in the future sometime We're probably like farther into the future you know when you when you i'm ready to retire and possibly uh, i was like then you're not retired because you're starting something new however <laughs> i think that's a, but it's also something my husband loves the hospitality space so it's something that we could share and he could support as well right is so if we're doing it together it might not feel as hard <laughs> yes absolutely yeah. i think uh, and i would be around my family so there'd be so much like i have probably a hundred cousins <laughs> nothing nothing yeah. better than that for yeah. sure yeah, yeah. that would be wonderful i can't wait whenever that happens in the future putting it out there in the universe so that yeah. it, it actually manifests um uh, this is beautiful jen you know uh what a what a great way to empower your community i think creating jobs employment is such an issue in canada right now we're looking at canada you know as a country there's there's just this crisis of jobs and inflation and we know all the all the uh challenges that we have ahead of us you know confronting us um this is a question that i ask all my guests on the show people from different backgrounds from different cultures from different industries and they all have their own vantage point on success and it's so different for each individual for a social activist it's about helping a child and ensuring a child doesn't go hungry mm -hmm. for a spiritual leader it is helping people feel their best self finding their happiness, finding their true purpose in life, um, and reconnecting with their own self. For an entrepreneur, it's about building a brand, being successful. You know, as you mentioned, a lot of entrepreneurs, it's it's mostly about amassing wealth. And that's the that's the that's that's the barometer of success. But to social entrepreneurs like you, it's not just monetization or wealth. It's about creating a larger positive impact in the world. So I am intrigued to learn about your equation of success. Mm. Well, it's, I have learned that I really believe it's about how good you feel or how happy you are uh, and that we can't let, I think this world's version, quite frankly, there's like this, and maybe because I'm focused in the entrepreneur space, there's this delusion that it is about materialism when, when I don't, I know that that's not where real happiness comes from. It comes from literally, there's like so much science behind this as well. It's like when you're out in the space doing things for other people, um, how big or small that is too, right? It, that doesn't, there's no scale to that. You're, you're, you feel successful because you're happy and that's an internal feeling that you get. Um, and I'm not sure if it's like a dopamine spike because you've done something and you get to feel good about yourself. And it's really interesting because I used to think, wow, that's so crazy. Because then you're like, am I going to go out and start doing things for other people because I want to feel good? But even if that's the case, it's like a win-win for everyone, right? And I feel like that's the, for me, definitely the definition is, of success is like how content and happy I feel inside and I know 
that I get that feeling the most when I'm doing something for somebody else. And the legacy you're leaving behind, right? Your, your words, your impact, it echoes for generations to come. Uh, truth be told, the last time I was in Sephora, I saw your brand and I took a picture there. <laughs> and I'm going to share it with you. Oh, uh, I was you. so happy to see that. And uh, that gave me even more excitement to be in conversation with you. And it's, and I'm sure that uh, people from the community, you know, also Canadians must be so proud to see that. Um, and especially like every time there is an Indigenous person looking at your products on the shelf of, you know, Sephora, because I think it is available across Canada, right? 50 Sephora stores across Canada, 600. I think that's a massive amount. 600 JCPenney stores across the United States. I think that's a huge achievement. Uh, I have to give you a big pat on your back because with a team of six, you're doing incredible, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I think that's that's some amazing distribution channel that you have right there. So thank you so much, Jen, for being on the Tenzin show. It's been such an honor being in conversation with you, learning from you, learning about your personal journey, your professional journey, uh, journey of cheekbone beauty, the inception, the story, and everything in between. I think it's truly been uh, an episode that uh, I'll hold very close to my heart. It's really etched in my memory now. Uh, so thank you so much, Jen. Uh, thank you so, so, so very much for being on the Tenzin Show. Thank you. This was my pleasure. It was so great to get to know you.